So my talk today is on human-robot interactive collaboration and communication. And the main argument that I'll be making throughout the talk is that we need methods, algorithms, but also interfaces that bring humans and robots together in shared physical spaces, while also enabling collaboration, communication, and learning. But before we get into any of that, maybe a little bit of a background about myself. So I'm German, but I grew up in the beautiful country of Tunisia. So Tunisia is this very touristy, beautiful place in North Africa. And so here's a picture of Tunisia. But actually, I grew up in the southern parts of Tunisia that looks like this. In particular, I grew up very close to a city called Tatawin in Arabic. And well, the name may not immediately ring a bell to you, but I'm pretty sure most of you know this place. Do you remember it? It's actually the planet Tatooine from the Star Wars movies. And so the Star Wars movies were shot in Tunisia in this place called Tatooine, just a couple of miles away from me. And so growing up, I had this impression and vision that robots would be roaming up and down the streets just a couple of miles away from me. And what's really compelling about the vision of the Star Wars movies is this vision and the kind of really enthralling vision of humans and robots working together and uh, collaborating together. So most famously in the movies, we see the robot C-3PO and R2-D2. And throughout the movie, they actually go on an adventure together with their human collaborators and partners. And by the end of the first trilogy, they become the breakout stars of, these movie, um, of the movie series. And what's really cool about the movies is that it shows different manifestations of human robot teaming and collaboration. So on one hand, it shows human robot physical collaboration. So they share the same physical space um, and they engage in physical interactions with each other. But at the same time, we also see interactions through language and instructions. So most famously in one of the major scenes of the movie trilogy, Princess Leia gives the robot R2-D2 instructions regarding the Death Star by just talking to the robot. At the same time, the movies also showed really new and um, innovative ways of communication and collaboration. So for example, the R2-D2 robot is able to use holographs and projections to communicate with human partners. And that's exactly the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. How can we bring humans and robots together in shared physical spaces such that they become partners? And so for that, what we need to be able to do is to enable the human to interact with the robot. So for example, provide instructions, provide physical interaction, uh, maybe even corrections saying, hey, this is not how you do it. This is how you do it. So there is some information flow from the human to the robot. But for this to be a true partnership, we also need the other way around. We need robots to be able to communicate back to humans. So for example, a robot may be providing an explanation saying why it did something. Similarly, a robot may ask a question to a human, sort of a clarification. And of course, in all of this, the robot needs to be able to physically engage and interact with the human partner in a safe manner. Another way of saying all of this is that what we need here is bidirectional communication and collaboration. So in a way, there is some information flow between them, but at the same time, they are intrinsically interacting and physically interacting with each other. And so that's the kind of stuff that we do at ASU in my lab. So we build and um, develop new machine learning algorithms for robots that allows them to physically interact with human partners. So think of, for example, a robot that learns to hug you, uh, a robot that learns to do assembly with you, or a robot that learns to, um, so here in the corner, a robot that learns to catch a ball with you. And so just generally, humans and robots working together on some complex physical tasks and communicating with each other. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, this is a rather big theme and it has multiple manifestations. What I'll be talking about in this talk is three specific things. So in the beginning of my talk, I'll be talking about responsive motion. How can robots create and generate responsive motion that is adaptive to the human's needs? Similarly, for humans and robots to work together, they need to synchronize their time. In many domains, we say timing is everything. And if you get the timing wrong, nothing works. And so how can we synchronize timing between these two partners? And finally, I'll also be talking about communication and the role of language in this sort of uh, partnership and collaboration. 
And what I mean by language is not only natural language, but also other forms of language, such as pictorial language. Think, for example, about um, the hieroglyphs in Egypt. Yeah? That's a sort of a pictorial language. And so with that, we come to the outline of my talk. And I shamelessly structured my talk along the scenes from the original Star Wars trilogy. So in the beginning, I'll be talking about learning responsive motion with imitation. After that, we will focus on instructions and how we can use natural language to create language conditioned policies for robots. And finally, we will switch gears and focus on how the robot can communicate back to a human partner. And so there we will focus on visual signaling and intention prediction. Okay, without further ado, let's start with the first part, learning responsive motion. So what do we mean exactly by responsive motion? Here are a couple of examples. Think, for example, about a person high-fiving someone else or a person handing over a book to someone. Similarly, also collaborative lifting of a heavy box. In all of these scenarios, we have some sort of social interaction between two partners. And what we'd like to do is to copy that and be able to create robot controllers that allow robots to engage in similar interactions, physical and social interactions with human partners. So a robot that high fives you or helps you carry a table, for example. Now, programming this is rather arduous and complex. Uh, it's very hard to predict what the human is going to do. And the methodology that we're going to propose in this talk is to learn these sort of collaborative and social behaviors through imitation, so by observing people. So think, for example, about the following, following scenario. Imagine you have a robot that is sitting in a park bench in a park on the first day. It's just observing how people are high-fiving each other. So it's observing multiple people high-fiving each other. Can the same robot on the next day go in there and engage in a similar interaction? So what the robot would need to do is to learn the rules of engagement, you could say, to learn from these examples how and when to engage in such an interaction and how to adapt the hand position, for example, and the timing to the human interaction part. And so in order to realize that, a couple of years ago, we proposed a framework called Interaction Primitives. And it's a data-driven framework that allows robots to learn HRI, so human-robot interaction, from demonstrations. The underlying principles are really simple. So first, we have videos or any sort of demonstrations of how people engage with each other. And now, from that data, we extract the information to model the mutual relationship between the two interaction partners, so person A and person B. And we model this as a joint probability distribution. So we have a probability distribution that models how did person A adapt its movements to person B and vice versa. And this pro joint probability distribution is called an interaction primitive. Once we've extracted it, we can then condition on it. So basically perform Bayesian inference. We can condition on it and say, well, now a robot is seeing a new person or the same person engaging in a new interaction. And now it conditions on that interaction and gets back a conditional probability distribution that tells it what would person B have done in this scenario. And so once we have this conditional probability distribution, we can use it for control. But one thing that's really nice about this framework is that it actually encapsulates both prediction and control within the same probabilistic framework. So instead of having two boxes, one for prediction and one for control, both of these are integrated uh, and are two sides of the same coin. Now, how do we actually do this? Well, for example, let's take the high five uh, demonstration and the high five task. So here's a picture of me and my former student, Marco. We are in the motion capture lab and we're just recording our own motion. So once we've recorded these demonstrations of multiple high fives, we then represent the observed trajectories. So the recorded data in a certain fashion. And we represent the data Y. So that's what we recorded. We represent it as a function H of some latent state S plus noise epsilon. And we'll talk about this late, later a little bit more in detail. But the underlying idea is to have a compressed representation from which we still need to be able to extract the component SA for person A and the component SB for person B. So this compressed representation should still allow us to extract out of that 
um, the components for each one of the partners. The interesting and novel part here is having this function h of s, which is a function of a latent state s. So s is our latent state representation. And so the second step in our framework is to bring the demonstrations to a fixed size latent state representation. Once we've done that, we can learn a generative model over that, which is the joint probability distribution I was mentioning earlier. So once we have this, um, this generative model, so that's happening at training time. Now at test time, we can have a robot engage in a similar interaction. So the robot sees a partial interaction meaning a partial movement of the human interaction partner. So for example, the person may be just starting to lift the hand. And so that gives us a new data set y, um, y star. What we can do is to condition on that. And so we have a probability distribution over the latent states. So P of S conditioned on the partial observation that we're seeing from the human. So once we've done, we've done this inference, we can then use the components of S, either SA kind of for person A or SB for person B to do either prediction or control. So we have both of the sides of the same coin. Okay, so, but for this, we need to better understand what the latent state representation is. So how do we actually transform our data? Well, it's actually a relatively simple trick. We take the function H of S of the latent state and we represent it as a superposition of basis functions. So in other words, in this specific case here, we have radial basis functions. That's these gray basis functions that you see here. And what we do is we sum them up in order to approximate our trajectory, the recorded data, which is the dashed line that you see there. But we don't just sum them up. Each one of these radial basis functions gets multiplied by a corresponding weight, wi. So in other words, we're just doing radial basis function approximation here. But the moment we do this, we're also introducing a new variable into this, which is phi. And the variable phi can be seen as a relative timer. So in other words, this is just a phase variable. When the relative timer phi is at zero, we're at the beginning of the motion. And when it's at one, we're at the end of the motion. So with zero, we're just starting. With one, we're at the end. Okay, so that introduces all the important components. We have the Ws, we take the Ws, we store them as a vector, and that's going to be representing the latent state. And we have phi, which represents time. So now we're good. We can just do inference over each one of these, and we should be able to do the um, reaction to the human partner. Well, that's what we did in the first paper, and it turned out to be a bad idea because the way we went about this is to use our interaction primitives and the Bayesian inference in order to model the spatial part. And then we used for phi in order to determine phi, we used time alignment techniques. So for example, dynamic time warping, which in other words meant that we decoupled time and space. And that's not a good idea at all. And that's what we're going to be discussing now. So the reason for that is the prediction errors that you make. So when you're interacting with someone, let's say kind of you're just throwing the ball and catching the ball. Um, so that's what we see here. What a kind of mistake that you can be making is a spatial mistake, meaning uh, the person throws the ball, you anticipate the position wrong. And as a result of that, the collaboration fails. But there is another kind of mistake, which is the temporal mistake. And so here in this case, my student Joe is trying to go to the right location, but at the wrong time. And so as a result of that, he's not able to catch the ball. And these errors, the prediction errors in space and time, they can also be compounding each other. So if you have errors in both of these, they can become a bit, really big error. So it turns out that this is actually kind of a problem. How do these, do these errors in time and space affect each other? But we can also use it to our advantage, how to leverage this relationship to actually make better inference. OK, let me explain this a little bit more in detail here. So, for this, we need to better understand the sources of estimation error and how to derive them and uh, better understand them. So here you see an example. So on the x-axis, you have time. So our phase variable, time. And on the y-axis, you have some spatial uh, variable, um, spatial variable y, which could be, for example, the position of the ball. The gray trajectory that you see here is our prediction for where the ball is. 
And the dashed line, the dashed blue line is our estimate of where we are in time. So given our estimate of where we are in time and our prediction for space, we basically say, well, the blue dot there, that's where we are right now, or that's where the ball should be right now. But unfortunately, the camera tells us the ball is somewhere completely else. Okay, the first reflex would be to say that this is a spatial error, but that doesn't have to be. So for example, this could be just a temporal error, meaning if we just shift our phase estimate backwards in time, we would end up with a position, with a different position um, that actually yields basically the same um, observation as what we see through the camera right now. But unfortunately, this is ambiguous. So it could also mean that we have to push forward in time and push our phase estimate forward in time. Um, and so in that case, again, we would have a new um, point for the estimated position for the ball, which would align with our observation. So which one of these is it? If we have only a single variable, that's really hard to figure out or potentially impossible. But if we use multiple uh, dimensionalities or multiple spatial variables, we actually can uh, figure out which one of these estimates um, or sources of error it is, space or time. So imagine in this case, we'd have a second spatial variable, y2. And again, we have some prediction over y2 in time. So now we have an error for both y1 and y2. And we can try to figure out, well, what kind of shift in phase would reduce the error in both of these, along both of these spatial dimensions. So it turns out if we move forward in time, we can reduce and eliminate the error in both of these dimensions. So in other words, we have a common error source here. And can, we can leverage this um, information that there is a common error source and that there, we are making correlated observation errors. We can leverage this in order to have a better estimate of where we are in time. Okay. So how can we actually incorporate that into our framework? It's relatively simple. In addition to the latent variable um, W, we also now add phase, phase velocity um, into our latent state. So basically where we are in time and what's the time velocity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, W basically encodes the trajectory shape, the shape of the motion, whereas phase and phase velocity um, models the temporal progression. One thing that's really nice about this framework is that now we can also do inference in time. So by observing a person, we can also get the probability distribution over phase, which tells us, well, it seems that we are 20% in into the motion and, and there is some uncertainty around it. So we have a probability distribution over phi, but at the same time, we can also generate a probability distribution over W. And you can think of that as a probability distribution about how the trajectories are going to continue into the future. So a prediction of the shape of the motion. And since this is a distribution, we can sample from it, which yields the red trajectories, but we can also take the mean of the distribution, which is just the blue trajectory that you see there. Okay, so with all of this, um, let's get to the actual application. So um, if you're interested in the actual nuts and bolts of how to do Bayesian inference here, um, we have actually, uh, created a, a specific framework for that, which I'll um, show in a second. But ultimately, just at a high level, what we're doing is approximate inference using ensembles. So in order to approximate this posterior, the probability of ST given some observations, we model that as an ensemble, um, as an ensemble, meaning we don't need to have any parametric assumption. We don't need to know that it's a Gaussian, for example, it could be anything. Um, and we don't need to perform any Taylor linearization. So we can make a prediction in time that is nonlinear. And also our measurement uh, update can also be nonlinear. So within this framework, we don't need to do any Taylor linearization. So that allows us to model these complex nonlinearities when you're collaborating with a, a robot or with the, another human person. So all of this is implemented in a library called Inprim. And we provide all of these inference uh, algorithms together with a lot of tutorials. If you're interested in that, please try it out. Okay, and so with that, let's get to the, uh, let's get back to the robotics part. So how do we use all of this? Imagine again, the task of throwing and catching. So in this case, we're going to have two students try to teach the robot how to catch the ball. One person is throwing the ball and the other one is teaching the robot how to catch it. 
So we take all of this data and we learn the interaction primitive out of that, as I mentioned earlier. And then at runtime, the robot can use the interaction primitive in order to make predictions about where the ball is going and where the human is going and then respond accordingly. A critical issue here, as I mentioned earlier, if we are using only few dimensions, it's very hard to figure out what kind of a, a so, an estimation error we're making. What's the estimation error source? And so what we're using here is we're using multiple sensing modalities to eliminate that error. Um, so by using the multimodal um, capabilities of inference. Okay, so here's the actual application of the robot. The person is throwing the ball, the robot is catching it. And you can see the same thing again, uh, blindfolded now. So the student is throwing the ball um, to different locations. The robot goes there and catches it. Keep in mind, all of the robot's actions were just learned from demonstration. It did not do any reinforcement learning optimization or anything like that. It was just learning a primitive, an interaction primitive, and is able to engage. Well, another important estimate or another important element here is its ability to estimate time. As I mentioned earlier, we're actually trying to infer where we are in time. Are we at the beginning or are we at the end? And so that's what you see here in the left upper corner. We have a probability distribution that gives us an estimate of where we are in time. Are we at the beginning or are we at the end? So at the end, we are at one. And so that's really neat. So the robot can learn to engage with the human partner. And now the question is, can we use this also for close contact collaboration where you don't have too much of a time between um, the person engaging with the robot and the robot having to generate the reaction. Keep in mind also here that timing is really important. Um, so in this case here, what the task for the robot is to, is to hug a person. So um, we have here the steady bear robot, it needs to learn how to hug the person. And we are going to see that we use the exact same algorithms as before, and the robot is trying to figure out how to hug a person, but also when. And so that's what we see here in this video. So in the beginning, the person is just changing the arm positions. So the robot is adapting to that. And now it says, oh, well, the person is moving in. So now it hugs the person. And when the person releases, the robot is also released. So here you see why spatial temporal inference is really important, right? incorporating time into all of this. And there are a variety of other application domains where this is true. So for example, we use the same algorithm for collaborative assembly, having humans and robots assemble an IKEA shelf together. And in that framework, it's not only enough to do a single primitive, we actually have to sequence multiple actions. So for example, the robot needs to first hand over a plate, then it needs to help a person hold a tool, or maybe it uh, hands over a screw, or uh, maybe it stabilizes something. So in other words, there, there is a sequence of actions that has to be performed there. And you can um, actually easily show that the same framework we introduced can also be used in these kind of sequential tasks, where the robot has to infer in which kind of task are we right now, and what should be my response. Another application domain is the ergonomic control of prosthetics. So when you're using a prosthetic, for example, it's very important that the prosthetic is responsive to the human user. In other words, this is again, human robot collaboration. And if it's not responsive, then people feel awkward about it and it can actually lead to musculoskeletal diseases. And so what we did in our um, work is to apply again the same principles of spatial temporal inference in order to have a prosthesis. So that's what you see here, a robotic prosthesis that is able to generate a natural gait for uh, a human user. And so what the, the prosthesis is doing is trying to figure out what should be the ankle angle based on the human's input and the human's motions. And the way it does that, and, and this is really the new twist that we introduced in our prosthesis, it tries to choose actions by minimizing the expected biomechanical stress. So having this ability to predict into the future, which our framework provides, we, can we are able to predict how much stress, physical stress is there going to be on the knee. And we can choose robot actions that minimize the stress and lead to ergonomic and safe robot control. So in these kinds of scenarios, it's important to be ergonomic in that it's biomechanically safe. Now, we've talked a lot about different modalities and the um, important for multimodal approaches. 
But ultimately, we skipped out on two of the most important modalities, vision and language. So how about those? Well, that's something that I'd like to talk about in the next part of my talk. In particular, I'll be talking about how to understand human instructions and um, human commands. And so if we follow the approach that I was mentioning earlier, learning by imitation, we can do a lot of things. So we can, for example, have a user teach a robot how to assemble a car door. But it's kind of awkward doing it that way by having a human just move the robot because there are a lot of things that you cannot convey this way by just moving things. So this motion domain is not enough to convey, for example, what's the name of the target object. You can't really pantomime that. Um, what is, for example, the go location? Uh, so that we need better ways of specifying that. What are the properties of the object? What's the name of the behavior that we're showing right now? What's the properties of the motion? All of that cannot really be conveyed using motion alone. And what we're proposing here is to have the user, as the user is providing a demonstration for imitation, have the user also describe it using natural language. So the user would basically just explain the task while um, the user is also demonstrating it to the robot. So think, for example, about you stepping into your kitchen one day and just um, telling Alexa or robot version of Alexa, hey, Alexa, this is how I prepare breakfast. I pick up the milk and then you show it physically. So you pick up the milk um, carton and then you pour it and then um, you stir the cereal and so on and so on. And so as you're physically demonstrating the task, you're also explaining what the task is and what the components of the task are. And so ideally, Alexa would be able on the next day to um, actually execute this and um, execute this on the robot. And so in our case here, um, what we try to do is to learn a, what we call a language condition policy, meaning after we've demo collected the demonstrations, we can still provide specific instructions to the robot and change what the robot is going to do. At training time, we have access to vision, language, and motion. So we have um, a camera feed, we have the natural language description of what the task is, and we have the physical demonstration of what the robot should be doing. So that's available at training time. Now, at test time, what we need to be doing is to only use language and vision. So at test time, the robot has maybe a new command, hey, prepare breakfast very quickly. And maybe the robot can also see what the current table layout is but the robot doesn't know what kind of motion it needs to perform. And so you can think of that really as a translation process. The robot now needs to use the collected data and the extracted model to make a translation to the motion domain. And so that's what we do in our framework, uh, that, or our methodology that we call language conditioned imitation learning. And the nitty gritty details um, are not really important here, um, the, the technical details, how we do that, but ultimately it's a big neural network that has a component in blue here that processes an input image and a command, a language command as input. And it generates as output the control parameters for the interaction primitive. And the parameters are exactly the parameters you saw earlier, the phase, the phase velocity, and the trajectory. So in other words, it's a translation process from image and language to control. Now, how do we get data for this? Well, in our case, we asked, subjects, uh, kind of human experts, you could say, uh, to provide demonstrations. But I want to be honest here. These are not exactly human experts. These are just students that I found in the corridor. So we asked students to provide 200 demonstrations. So they would teach a robot how to do something. And they would annotate these demonstrations with textual descriptions. So they would write down what actually is being performed right now. And then we also take those 200 demonstrations and then we inflate them or do a data augmentation to get 45,000 synthetically generated demonstrations. Now you may be wondering, how do we do that? Well, it turns out in language, it's rather easy to do that. You can take a sentence and you can replace words by their synonyms. So if you have a sentence that says, pick up the large mug, we can also say, pick up the big mug. So basically just replacements of synonyms. Okay, so here's now the final network. It takes as input a camera feed. It processes that in the perception subnetwork. It also takes as an input, pick up the green cup, a command that goes through a language subnetwork. 
then the results of both of these go into an attention network that it extracts a low dimensional vector that describes the task. That goes into a policy network that now generates the motor primitive parameters. And once we have the parameters, we can just run them on the controller on the robot and the robot executes the task that we actually gave it using the language command. Okay, so here are a couple of nitty gritty details on the training side. This is only for the, for the experts uh, among you when it comes to deep learning. So in our case, we have a, a rather complex cost function. Um, so that's the L that you see there at the bottom. The cost function has multiple components. Some of these components are related to the object or kind of what kind of object is in the scene. You can also say related to the visual part of the image. Some components are related to the phase variable, so the temporal part. And then there are some components that are related to the trajectory reconstruction error. So how faithful is the movement that the robot reproduces at the end? Okay, and so it turns out if you don't use a relatively complex cost function, then it can be tricky to achieve success here. So the cost function that I have here at the bottom is what you see in blue. And with that cost function, we get 98% um, accuracy or success in picking, pouring, or sequential tasks where you're doing picking and pouring in sequence. Um, and if you change something in the cost function, you can see a significant decline in the uh, performance, so from 98 to 62, which basically indicates that we need to be really careful here in what kind of cost function we choose in training this. Similarly, we also did a test where we looked at how well this generalizes to new human partners. So if a, a new person comes in and maybe that person explains the task differently, would the language model generalize to that? And so in the case of the picking task, we actually saw that, um, yeah, it kind of generalizes really well. Maybe there is less variety there of how pe people can express picking. Uh, but in the case of pouring, people use different words and verbs for, for pouring. And so as a result of that, we saw a substantial uh, decline. So now only 69% of the task, we actually were successful in translating the human's command into robot actions, which means we still need to put a little bit of effort into language generalization. And just to highlight that, here's a video where you see different ways of, um, or different commands that were provided by a user. For example, lift the container or elevate the green container or um, fill all of it into a small green dish or spill everything into the curved dish. So people may have different ways of expressing the same thing. So of course, we also had to do this uh, on the real robot. Um, so we executed all of this on the real robot. Um, and so now you have the ability to really just step up to it and say, hey, kind of, can you do this for me? And then uh, it executes that. And here in this example, you'll see even um, that it accounts for small modifiers. So if you say spill everything into the large blue container, it uses the word large to disambiguate which container is being meant here. Um, similarly, it can also um, figure out whether you're saying, uh, pour all of it or just a little bit into the container. Recently, we also applied this to a scenario where you, you're basically giving commands or instructions to a taxi driver. So think about you sitting in a taxi and telling a taxi driver, hey, uh, take a right at the light. And so now the taxi driver is driving. And then when there is a light coming up, the taxi driver says, uh, okay, now I have to turn right. So that's where we that's where we, we saw the, the light. Huh? Um, so at the end here, uh, let me just stop there. So there was a light there. And so when our neural network saw the light, it actually said, okay, now I have to turn right. Huh? Uh, similarly here um, in this task, we're saying make a right near the red bricked house. So it saw, okay, there was a, a red bricked house and then it turns right. So again, we're using these verbal commands to actually identify from the scene landmarks and then translate all of that into commands for a robot. Um, recently, one thing we've been also exploring is how to have a robot explain something back to a human. And so you can think of that as some sort of cap captioning process where the robot is trying to explain what it just did. And so it takes the camera feed and it also takes its internal states, the robot states, and tries to translate all of that or caption all of that and turn it into a sentence. So in other words, in this case, we're actually going the other way around. We, we're trying to turn video and 
states into language rather than language to the states for the robot. And so, for example, in this case, the robot may be saying, um, given what I observed here, the task was the right robot exchanged the glass with the left robot. So a sort of explainable AI. Um, and of course, we had to run this then um, actually in, in this case in simulations, but um, so that's what you're going to see here. One robot executes something, and then we translate all of that to language. So the left robot opened the saucepan, and now the right robot picked up the cup. So, so that was about language, but maybe there is a different means. Are there other means of communication beyond just natural language? Can we do something maybe faster, something that communicates things quicker? And so using the Star Wars inspiration again, here we're going to be focusing on visual signaling and what I call intention projection. So in the case of intention projection, we want to communicate complex things and tasks and instructions to a human user using visual cues. And the way we do that is by employing mixed reality. In other words, we're using the context or the environment as a canvas on which we just draw things. And the way we do that is by using a projector that's next to a robot and the projector projects into the environment information for the human to understand. Let me just explain that a little bit more in detail. So this is the typical setup for intention projection. So you have a human and a robot, and maybe they need to perform a joint task like lifting a box. Well, in this setup here, the robot also has access to a projector and an RGB camera. And now with the RGB camera, it can detect a box. Right? So it does computer vision to detect the box. And it can also track the box in time. So it knows what the pose and the position is across different frames. In addition, using the projector, we can project on top of the object information like textures. So you can project on top of the object information for the human collaborator and partner to read. And so that's what you see here in this video. Um, so for example, in this case, the robot is telling the human to area one. So move this box to area one. And there is um, this four centimeters here says how much of a distance is still left. And when the person is finished, the robot says, okay, rotate the box. Okay, the person is finished again. And now the robot is saying, okay, don't touch the box because uh, I'm going to manipulate it. And so what we want to do here is to ensure safety by projecting the safety triangle. Keep in mind that in the setup here, we have a camera and a projector. That's what you see in the right there uh, next to the robot. So the robot picks up the box, moves the box, and you can see that our projections follow actually. Keep in mind that this is mixed reality. So we are not using any goggles. We are not using any head up display or anything like that. This is actually really happening in the real physical space. And we're using the projector to draw on the real physical space. Now, you may be wondering, maybe the task was too easy to um, simplify, <clears throat> excuse me. We can do the same thing also in more complex scenarios. So we applied it also to collaborative assembly where humans and robots have to collaboratively assemble a car door. So that's more com uh, complex. And so here again, we're using the same methodology. We're detecting the object or the car door in this case, using computer vision. We're tracking it and we're using that information to calculate 3D information, which we're going to be drawing on top of the car door. And then once we project all of this into the real world, we have really the environment as our screen. Okay, here's an example for that. So what you see in the middle um, is the actual car door being moved. And on the floor, you see additional information about how much distance is still left um, or how much the person has to rotate the car door. And so in this case here, the green dot needs to go on top of the white dot. And the person can do that by just moving the car door. So align the car door and the person aligns the car door by moving the green dot onto the white dot. The robot can also project information as, as sort of a warning about um, any potential collision or any potential risks to the person. So in this case here, the robot can actually project um, its safety area saying, stay out of this area or stay away from the robot. And it projects specifically to the person which areas are safe and which areas are non-safe. Similarly, the robot can also accurately guide the human throughout the um, task. And so we can project, for example, information saying, hold the object over here and rotate it. 
So in this case, the person needs to align the green line with the white line. And when the person is finished, we say, you're done. So really think of this as a just-in-time teaching and collaboration framework where we are providing information by tracking what the person is doing, by tracking what the objects in the environment or where objects in the environment are, and by projecting specifically into certain areas in the environment information. So in this case here, we're projecting information saying these two parts need to be joined. And so this may sound like it's very specific to a task, but actually we have shown in one of our papers that you can create a nice visual language out of this that allows you to create sentences, kind of visual sentences by combining the different pieces, verbs and objects and um, and, and so on and so on, and, and, and adjectives and so on. So by representing all of that in the visual space, we can create some sort of visual language. And at the end, we also did, of course, a user study where we compared this to a, a printed uh, sort of a collaboration task where you users had just uh, a piece of paper with the task description on as a piece of paper, basically just um, a verbal task description. And we also tested this against uh, a sort of a, uh, an iPad where we had on the iPad additional instructions for the person. Um, and so we tried to figure out, does the projection help when we compare it against an iPad with videos and um, sort of an interactive description of the task, or when we compare it to a more traditional textual description on a piece of paper. And we saw that across human robot fluency, safety and trust in the robot, task execution and task load, we saw substantial improvements in all of these metrics. But one thing that was really helpful to me in better understanding why people like this is people actually said that they like the scenario because it was more fun, it was game-like. So there is this element of gamification in all of this. And that made me think about this. So if you think about things like Fitbits and these modern watches, uh, for example, the Samsung watch, um, they try to use some sort of visual feedback in order to encourage the user. So in, a, in one of these smart watches nowadays, they would show these emblems and these badges to you whenever you go running or you stand up after two hours. It's a sort of visual reward. You give visually some sort of reward or some sort of encouragement. And so one of the things I'll be investigating next is how to use this mixed reality projection technique in order to give visual rewards to the human user and kind of a guidance and, and help the human learn. So not only have the robot learn to adapt to the human, but potentially also kind of reward the human and condition the human's behavior to become a better partner in this collaboration and partnership. And so with that, we come to the end of my talk. I hope uh, I was able to, to show you uh, different flavors of the kind of research that we do in my lab. All of this was really about bringing humans and robots in joint and shared physical spaces. And we've talked about how to leverage multimodal data in order to make inference in time, in order to make inference over language. We also talked about how we can improve physical collaboration. We, we've seen robots hugging people, robots catching a ball, robots collaboratively assembling an IKEA shelf with a person and so on. And well, we also talked about different forms of language. So visual cues and, and but also natural language where you just give natural language commands and instructions to the robot. And so with that, I come to the end of my talk. I hope uh, you really uh, enjoyed it. I would like to just thank our sponsors at the end. Thank you all so much. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have. 